Okay, this is the legislative branch review. This will help you on your legislative branch quiz as well as the test. Um, we're going to start with U.S. Congress and we're going to start with the basics. Um, you will need to review the qualifications for being in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, remember the House, they were supposed to be closer to the people. That's why they're reelected every two years because they have to stay with their ear to the ground of what the people want. Um, so if they do something that the people don't want, uh, it's an opportunity for the people to get rid of them a little bit quicker. Uh, they're younger, 25 years old. You have to live in the district that you represent. Um, you have to be a citizen of the United States, a resident of the United States. Okay, so remember those things. The Senate, you're a little bit older, 30 years old. You have to live in the state that you represent. Um, again, you have to be a citizen of the United States, um, natural born or naturalized for both of those positions. Um, you need to go over the powers, uh, powers that are specifically delegated to the House and powers that are specifically delegated to the Senate. Like their number one power is to write laws, power of the purse, uh, the power to tax and spend belong, you know, belongs with the House of Representatives. And remember the House Ways and Means Committee is the one that is going to legislate or mark up a lot of the legislation when it comes to spending. They also do things that don't have anything to do with legislation, like investigate and oversight of executive agencies and businesses, break electoral college ties, declare war, uh, propose amendments, and then I put N and P up here, uh, necessary and proper clause, so when using necessary and proper clause, they can expand their power beyond what is delegated to them or expressed in the Constitution. Uh, review checks, uh, impeachment of president and judges, veto power, and pro uh, power to approve judicial and executive uh, agency appointments, and the power to ratify treaties. Um, remember that in the election of Congress members, incumbents, or people that are current office holders seeking re-election have an advantage, and their advantages include people know their name, name recognition, franking privilege, which means they get to mail stuff for free, uh, more PAC donations because they have a voting record. People can, uh, interest groups can look at them and say, hey, they've supported our cause in the past, so we're going to go ahead and give them assistance. Also, PACs know or interest groups know that they're going to probably win because they're incumbents, so they're going to give incumbents more money. Uh, they are able to go back to their constituency and say, I have a record of service for you. I've done casework for you. Uh, I have secured your, your district or your locality, federal government money through pork barrel legislation. Every 10 years, a census is taken to determine if there are pop major population shifts between states. Remember, people have moved away from the Rust Belt or the Northeast and the Midwest and moved to the Sun Belt, which is the South. And that means that the South has, Southern states have picked up more districts and more representatives. And those representatives and districts have come from the Northern states that have lost population. Now, when you reapportion seats to um, account for population shifts, you have to redistrict. Uh, one of the tactics of redistricting is partisan gerrymandering. Remember, redistricting is the responsibility of state governments, state legislatures, draw district lines, or hire groups to draw district lines for them. A tactic they use in gerrymandering is looking at particular demographics and trying to determine how they're going to vote, whether they're going to be Republican or Democratic, and they use packing and cracking voters, where they'll pack a bunch of uh, the same demogra demographic into a district and crack them throughout the rest of the state so they can secure seats for their political party in the House of Representatives. Think the redistricting game. What you have to do with the redistricting game is what Congress or state legislatures do with congressional districts. And then um, committees. Committees are huge part of um, a huge part of the Congress. They are the workhorses of Congress. Um, you want to be on a committee that is going to allow you to serve your constituents. So, for example, a representative from Hampton Roads would want to serve on the Armed Services Committee because we are so tied, so much tied to federal government spending for the military. 
Um, caucuses, remember those, I compared those to clubs, like after school clubs. Caucuses are congressional cub, um, clubs that you can join, like the Black, uh, the Black Congress Members Caucus or the Women's Caucus. Um, they aren't like a committee, but they can definitely push and work for legislation that benefits their group's cause. All right, let's talk about how a bill becomes law. Um, influences over a Congress member's decision. The party whip is going to play a huge role in how you vote most of the time. Um, the party whip is there to maintain party, party unity score and to keep an open line of communication between congressional leadership and the rank and file members of Congress of the party. Uh, party unity score is the percentage of times where party members vote along party lines. And party unity score in both the House and the Senate stays at around 90%. And that has gone up in the past couple of decades. So generally, Republicans are going to vote Republicans. Democrats are going to vote Democrats. The higher your party unity score, the better your whip is. Uh, you're going to break with your party most close to election time when you want to look like a delegate to your constituents that you're like going back to your localities and you're voting based on what your constituents want, not necessarily what your party wants. Uh, log rolling. Log rolling is a legislative quid pro quo. I'll vote for your bill if you vote for my bill. Uh, that's also going to influence uh, how Congress people vote. Interest groups, of course, uh, interest groups are there to provide reliable and highly technical information that, of course, is biased. So if you need some information regarding some kind of bill that you're not familiar with or a subject that you don't have a lot of background knowledge on, you're going to call up an interest group and interest group can give you information regarding that. All right. How a bill becomes a law steps. Okay, remember, first and foremost, it is introduced by a member of Congress, either in the Senate or the House. If it is a spending or taxing bill, it has to be started in the House. You cannot introduce a bill to Congress on the floor if you are the president or an interest group or a constituent. You have to find a sympathetic Congress member to do that for you. Um, the Speaker has power of referral decision. So that's something that's very powerful. Um, that's a very powerful uh, tool, political tool, that the Speaker of the House can use. Uh, they can refer a bill to a committee. If they want the bill to die, they're going to refer it to a committee that they know that they'll kill it. If they want the bill to pass, they're going to refer it to a bill that they know will work on it. Um, committee work. Most work happens in committees. Committees then push the work like the figuring out of the details, the markup process, and the hearing process, they push that onto a subcommittee, a more specialized, smaller group within the committee. Um, this in the markup process is where the details of legislation occur, where it's edited and amendments are added. Uh, subcommittees are going to hold hearings, testimony, um, and that's supposed to be testimony by experts and agencies. I'm going to fix that real quick. And it is fixed. Okay, um, so uh, what happens in a hearing at the subcommittee level is that there is testimony by experts and government agencies that are going to be responsible for enforcing this law. So they want to hear from the people who are actually going to have to carry the law out. And then at this point, um, once the subcommittee's work gets back to the committee, um, you're either going to report on the law favorably and recommend passage but chances are the bill is going to die because most bills uh, most bills do die in committee. Um, so once a bill is voted on and then it goes to the other house and the other house does all of its steps, the next, the last thing that has to happen before a bill is presented to the president is it goes through the conference committee. A conference committee is a joint committee that has members of the house and the Senate. Generally the people who are working on the conference committee were members of the standing committee that had actually done the original work on the bill in their respective houses. Um, and their whole job in conference committee is to resolve any disagreements on a particular bill or any, um, you know, to kind of compromise over the different versions that, came, you know, the version that came out of the House and the version that came out of the Senate. Conference committees are going to be 
a lot more contentious if there is one party that holds the House and one party that holds the Senate. Okay, um, another really important thing that pops up on the AP exam a lot is to recognize the differences between the House and the Senate way of writing legislation. Okay, so in the differences between the House and the Senate, it is important to note that in general, a senator has more of an opportunity to influence the outcome of legislation because there are less rules in the Senate. In the Senate, you have an unlimited time to debate, which can lead to a filibuster by the minority party, because sometimes this is the only way that a minority party can prevent the passage of a bill. So they're going to filibuster it or talk it to death or in order to delay a um, vote. Now, they don't even actually have to physically stand up and talk a bill to death. Most of the time, they just threaten to filibuster. And if the majority party doesn't have 60 votes, um, which is necessary for cloture, that's all that they have. the minority party has to do is to threaten to filibuster. Um, in the Senate, uh, one of the ways that you can directly influence the outcome of legislation is that you can add writers, which are non-spending, non-relevant amendments. So a writer is a non-spending amendment, and an earmark is a spending amendment, like aka this is how a lot of pork ends up in legislation. And um, they don't have to do with anything uh, to do with the original bill. And if you have a piece of legislation that has a lot of writers and earmarks on it, a lot of times that's referred to as a Christmas tree bill because it has a bunch of stuff like hanging on it or tacked to it um, that isn't really the original text. In the House, in the House you get to use a discharge petition. So any member of the House, after a committee has had a bill for 30 days and they're not doing anything or they're not moving on it or they're not reporting on it favorably, uh, may petition to have it brought to the floor. Uh, the House has a rules committee, which determines if a bill can be debated and if it is closed or open for amendments. That's a very prestigious and powerful committee to sit on. So that is something that um, a House of Representatives members member would covet, is being able to sit on that committee. You can only debate in the House for five minutes. There's just too many representatives to allow for unlimited debate. And all amendments in the House must be germane or have relevance or salience to the original content of the bill. President. Okay, I um, don't want you to think that the president is necessarily always going to be a check on the legislative process because they do want to see legislation get passed. In order for a president to be able to fulfill their promises and not look like somebody who's just using a bunch of executive orders in order to get their campaign promises fulfilled, they really do need legislation to be passed. Um, so he is going to lobby uh, Congress in order to get legislation passed, especially if that legislation is going to reflect the promises he made in the campaign. Um, the president can threaten to veto a bill. Uh, generally, this is his way to get Congress to change a bill or not pass it at all. Uh, threaten to veto is really going to work best if the president is popular. Um, and if he's working with his party in Congress, because really... Um, Republicans in Congress didn't care if Obama was going to threaten to veto a bill so much. They would you know, still work on it, hand it to him, allow him to veto it because it just makes Obama look like he is the one responsible for not allowing anything to be accomplished in um, Congress. Um, the president can veto or reject a bill. He has to reject all of the bill. He cannot line out and veto, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, once the president has vetoed or rejected the bill, then it goes back to Congress for an attempt to override, and this only happens 5% of the time. The president can pocket veto. If Congress is out of session and the president takes no action on a bill for 10 days, uh, that bill dies and it cannot be overturned because Congress isn't there to vote on an override. Um, there is no power to line item veto, and that has been the case since Clinton versus New York, where the Supreme Court said that the president must reject all parts of a bill. He cannot line out or mark out parts of a bill, even though Clinton did use this to try to, bal or to balance our budget um, by getting rid of pork. The Supreme Court said it was an unconstitutional use of power. And that being said, um, on the flip side, Congress cannot use a legislative veto. Uh, that was declared unconstitutional as well uh, because it violated separation of powers. And that's when Congress uh, declares an act of the president null um, 
or you know rejects an act of the president. So that's no longer allowed um, either. Okay, so that is the review of U.S. Congress.